Hello everyone and thank you for joining us for today's event. This is part of a mini series of events which highlight the questions most frequently asked on our helpline from the top five most common topics. These are discipline, dismissal and grievance, contracts, redundancy, layoffs and tupi, wages um, and diversity and discrimination. And today we're going to focus on your discipline, dismissal and grievance questions. So before we get started, I'd like to explain a little bit about who ACAS are and what we do. So we provide employees and employers with free impartial advice on workplace rules, rights and good practice. We also offer training for your workplace and we have courses available to book now and Becca is sending a link for you. We help resolve disputes. And our online advice is updated regularly where you can find the latest information about good practice for employers and employees. Our website has a number of free template letters, forms and policies for employers, HR managers and employees which are free to download and use. So we're going to be looking at the commonly asked questions on this topic but firstly we thought it was a good idea to, to define what these terms mean. So uh, a disciplinary procedure is a formal way for an employer to deal with an employee's behaviour or performance. A dismissal is when an employer ends an employee's contract and it usually means the same as being sacked or fired. And a grievance procedure is a formal way for an employee to raise a problem or complaint to their employer and it could be verbal or written. So in this webinar, we're going to be looking at the questions our advisors tell us that they are asked about most frequently on the ACAS helpline from both employers and employees. So well, let's move on to the questions. So first up, a very common one that we receive on the helpline, when an employee has been suspended. So I've been suspended and it's not fair. What do I do? So our answer is there are a few points that are important to consider here. So let's take a look. So first of all, it's important to be aware that suspension is not a disciplinary sanction nor an assumption of guilt. An employee should be paid in full unless their contract stays otherwise. The reason for suspension should be explained by the employer and confirmed in writing. A suspension should only be used to, pro to protect where there is a potential risk and the risk could be um, the investigation, for example, if an employee is concerned that a fair investigation can't be carried out whilst an employee is on site and perhaps they, may, they might try to influence witnesses, they may decide to suspend. It could be a risk to other employees, for example, where there has been conflict between staff. It may be for best for them not to work together during an investigation. There may be a risk to business assets, for example, if the allegation is that someone is stealing, an employer could suspend to make sure that the risk of further offences happening is minimised. There could be a risk to customers or clients, for example, vulnerable service users who need to be safeguarded from potential harm. Suspension may also be used to protect the employee themselves, for example, to ensure the employee does not suffer physical or emotional harm from other employees. Always a decision whether to suspend should be reasonable and should not be a knee-jerk reaction. If an employer identifies risk to the person remaining at work, they should consider alternative options before a decision is made about whether, whether to suspend. Examples may include a transfer to another site or a department, a temporary change in role, working from home or similar temporary alternatives. Employers should be mindful of the stress suspension causes to employees and keep those who are suspended up to date as even if an employer has reason to, a person is likely to believe their suspension is unfair. Updates could include progress of the investigation, how long the suspension is likely to last for and updates regarding any delays or changes. If an employee does not think their suspension is justified or they do not think that they have give, been given enough, enough information, their concerns should be raised to the employer. An employer should address the concerns fairly and consider whether suspension is an appropriate action during an investigation and potential disciplinary procedure. Remember, if an employee does not believe a procedure has been handled fairly, they can raise a formal grievance, appeal a disciplinary sanction, or perhaps even make a claim to an employment tribunal in some cases. So our next question is, so how much notice should I get of a disciplinary hearing? 
So to comply with the ACAS code of practice, hearings should be held without unreasonable delay, whilst allowing the employee a reasonable time to prepare their case. It is common to give a minimum of 48 hours notice, but this is a minimum depending on the complexity of the case. For example, if the investigation took three months, 48 hours is unlikely to be a reasonable for an employee to go through the evidence and prepare, which is the purpose of notice being given. So some organisations will have a time frame set out in their policy, and this must be adhered to. If an employer would prefer to have the hearing sooner because it's causing them stress, for example, they, they could request that it is brought forward and an employer can decide where, whether they can accommodate this. It's best practice that any such request is put in, void, in writing to avoid any future disputes. If an employee's representative is not available on the date the employer suggests, an employee can ask for the meeting to be held at a later date, so long as the new date is within a reasonable time. The Code of Practice states this should be within five days, but the Tribunal has considered that employers should be not be too restrictive about this time frame, as this could potentially lead to unfair outcomes. So to summarise, the notice an employer gives of a formal hearing should be a reasonable amount of time for the employee to review any evidence, prepare and arrange a person to accompany them should they want to exercise this right. If someone believes they've not been given appropriate notice, the employer should address this. So moving on to our next question, and our next question is, who can an employee bring to a disciplinary or grievance hearing? Can it be a friend or family member? And we'll look at the answer. So there is a legal right that allows employees to be accompanied by either a trade union representative or a work colleague. If an employee works with a family member and they would like them to attend, an employer must allow this under the right to be accompanied as this will fall within the category of colleague. So some organisations might allow other companions, so it's important to check any policy. An employee can request for someone else to accompany them. An employer does not always have to allow the, the request, but an employee should be clear why they are making such a request. So if a request is needed because of a disability, an employer must consider their duty to make reasonable adjustments. Other adjustments could be made where there is a language barrier and the company can help to interpret. The companion can help to interpret, sorry. This is to ensure that the employee has a fair hearing and everything is fully understood by all parties. It should also be noted that there is no right to take legal representation as an employer is following an internal process and it's not a legal matter at this stage. So let's move on to our fourth question. So can an employer make someone attend a disciplinary meeting while they're off sick? And let's look at our answer. So an important point first here is that an employer can't force an employee to attend any meetings or hearings. It is the employee's decision whether to engage or not. However, of course, there can be risks if a person refuses to attend a meeting. It might be a reasonable expectation for an employee to attend a disciplinary meeting, even if they are off sick. But this can depend on the length of time a person is expected to be absent for and the reasons for their sickness. If someone is on a short-term absence, perhaps for a cold or stomach bug, an employer might decide to pause the disciplinary procedure until the person is well enough to attend, as this should only cause a short delay. And remember, a disciplinary procedure should go ahead without unreasonable delay. However, if the employee is likely to be off sick for a long time, an employer should take all reasonable steps to support the employee under their duty of care. An employer should uh, not put un unnecessary pressure on an individual to attend a meeting during a sickness absence. However, there are several things they might consider when deciding whether it is reason reasonable to go ahead. Employers should consider the reason for the absence and the impact of the process on the health and well-being of the employee. Employers should also consider whether it would be beneficial for the employee to attend during sickness. If the reason for the absence is stress-related, the disciplinary concluding matters sooner might relieve the stress. Also, whether there may be a need to obtain a medical opinion regarding fitness to attend, for example, from a person's GP or occupational health. It's worth thinking about whether a postponement would be a reasonable adjustment if the employee has a disability. It could depend on how serious the allegation is and if there are any rules uh, for failing to attend and whether they have been any similar circumstances in the past. <laughs> 
So to come to a reasonable decision, an employer should consider all circumstances, which might include a discussion with the individual to try to agree what's best. But if there is no other option and the issue needs to be resolved, an employer may choose to hold the meeting in an employee's absence. So the next question is one we receive quite frequently from employees. And our next question is, I've just been dismissed for no reason. Can my employer do that? So it might be that the employer has genuinely not provided a reason for this dismissal. And in this case, there is a risk to the employer, especially if the person has more than two years of service. So after two years of service, an employee has the right to request written reasons for a dismissal and can make a claim of unfair dismissal if they choose. Regardless of length of service, good practice is, or is to always follow a fair disciplinary procedure before any sanction, such as a dismissal, is reached. During the procedure, the employee should be informed of the issue with their performance or capability, presented with evidence and given the opportunity to present their side of the situation. If this does not happen, the procedure is likely to be considered unfair and if taken to an employment tribunal, the judge will take into account whether the ACAS code of practice has been followed. Alternatively, perhaps the employer believes that they have been clear in the reasons for the dismissal, but the employee disagrees. The employee should bring their concerns to their employer and allow the employer the opportunity to explain any misunderstandings before potentially pursuing further. So on to another question frequently asked by employees, and that one is, do I need two years of service to claim unfair dismissal if my employer didn't follow the ACAS code of practice? And our answer is, an employee needs two years of service to make a claim of ordinary unfair dismissal. This claim can be made if an employer has acted unreasonably in dismissing an employee, and that may be that the employer didn't have a proper reason to dismiss, or they acted unreasonably in how the dismissal was carried out. So, for example, an employer who does not follow their own procedure will likely to be acting unreasonably. An employee with less than two years of service would only be able to bring a claim if they could show their dismissal was for an automatically unfair reason, for example, being a member of a trade union, taking action over a health and safety issue, or that they have been discriminated against based on the Equality Act characteristics, or that their contract was breached in the way that they were dismissed, and this is called wrongful dismissal. So it's important to note that failure to follow the ACAS code of practice does not give rise to claim in its own right, but is taken into consideration by the tribunal in relevant cases. And if a tribunal thinks that an employer has failed unreasonably to follow the code of practice, they can add up to 25% onto any award made. So we'll move on to question seven. And that one is, if an employee has mental ill health, can they still be taken through a disciplinary procedure? And our answer is, if an employee is experiencing mental ill health and makes their employer aware of it, this does not prevent an employer taking justified disciplinary action. Its disciplinary rules should be applied consistently. However, an employer needs to be mindful that mental ill health can be a disability and they should remember their obligations under equality law to make reasonable adjustments if this is the case. So if an employee's behaviour or performance is a concern, there may be a cause to follow a disciplinary procedure. If it's linked to a mental health condition, for example, they have been late on several occasions because they are taking a new medication for panic attacks and side effects are making it difficult to get up in the morning, then the employer should explore how to support the person before moving to any formal procedure. So during a disciplinary process, someone with a mental health condition might need additional support. An employer should consider what this looks like. So for example, they may allow a family member to attend as a companion adjusting the position from the strict legal right. If the employee suggests this, may help them engage in the process. So if an employee knows what adjustments might help, they should explain these to the employer for consideration. If employers or employees are unsure what, what could help, they might request medical advice. So moving on to our next question. So I have raised a grievance, but my employer is not responding. How long do they have to get back to me? And we'll just run through the answer to this one. So 
The ACAS Code of Practice requires that employers should arrange for a formal meeting to be held without unreasonable delay after a grievance is received. Organisations might have a time frame set out in their policy that they are required to respond within, so it's important to check this. If an employee feels that an employer is not dealing with the issue promptly, they should, in the first instance, follow up with the person they raised the grievance with and request an update. It would be good practice for an employer to provide an expected time frame or any explanation for any delays. It's also important to note that for cases which can be taken to a tribunal, strict time limits apply. These vary slightly based on what has been claimed, so an employee who wishes to potentially make a claim should take advice on this at an early stage to avoid being out of time. The duty to comply with these time limits is not usually extended by delays and as a, from an employer responding to a grievance. So we'll move on to our next question now. And the next one is, I'm on sick leave and my employer has dismissed me. Can they do this? So an employer can be dismissed while on sick leave, but this should never be a surprise to an employee. An employer should have a policy that deals with long-term ill health and employers may find it difficult financially when someone is off unwell for long periods of time. And this can be particularly difficult for small employers who have fewer resources. So when an employee is on sick leave, an employer should maintain regular contact with them. How often and by what means would be agreed between them? It is usually best to use a method of communication that allows for two-way conversation, so face-to-face, -face, video or telephone call. During these conversations, an employer should discuss with their employee how their health is, whether it is improving and whether any adjustments may need to be made for them to return to work, for example, a phased return. It is a good idea to consult with a GP or occupational health provider to explore what adjustments would help support an employee. It is a good idea for an employer to have a review point after so long. They will carry out an assessment to determine whether the employee is likely to return to work. They should ask for medical advice and hold a meeting to discuss this. During this meeting, an employer and an employee should explore any adjustments that could be made to the job, which would help the employee to return to work. If no adjustments would help or they are not reasonable, the next stage would be to consider whether a different role in the organisation could be more suitable. Dismissal should be the final step of the full process and a last resort. Medical advice should be taken and adjustments considered at all stages. So moving on to our final question, and that one is, what are my rights when I have been dismissed? Is what my employer doing fair? So the answer to this one is, if an employee has been dismissed, um, their rights depend on their length of service and the reason for the dismissal. We've covered most of those already, so in brief, an employer should follow a fair procedure and ACAS would advise all employers to follow a fair procedure that relates to the reason for the dismissal or they may risk an unfair dismissal claim. Employers should follow the ACAS code of practice on discipline and grievance as a minimum, as well as their own procedures. As discussed, failure to do so can make a process unfair and could risk an unfair dismissal claim. So if dismissed, an employee is entitled to be given a notice period unless they are dismissed for gross misconduct. An employee is always entitled to their statutory or contractual notice, whichever is longer. Another right to receive written reasons for dismissal. So it is good practice for an employer to always give these, but the legal right applies to pregnant workers or those on maternity or adoption leave. And remember, somebody employed for more than two years has the, the right to request these terms. Employees should be offered the right to appeal a dismissal and employers should hear appeals fairly with an independent manager chairing the meeting and making the final decision. Remember, if an employee does not believe the appeal resolves the situation, in some cases a claim can be made to an employment tribunal. So it's important employers are confident that they have acted fairly and lawfully. So I'm just going to hand you back over to Becca, our, our presenter now, uh, our organiser now. ACAS run training in person and digitally to meet your needs. For example, a few of the courses that we're currently running are contracts, HR for beginners, and ACAS bite size, working time regulations and employer obligations.
the benefit of all our training sessions is that you can interact with our advisor, collaborate with like-minded individuals and ask questions to ensure you understand the context in relation to your own situations. You can also follow up with the individual trainer if further support is required. We can also run any of our training for individual workplaces and in this case the content can be fully tailored to you. For more information on prices and how to book, please visit our website using the link on the slide, head to the training section or call us on 0300 123 1150. We really hope to see you on one of our courses soon. Our webinars run regularly, so please join us again 